Uh, hey, what's up? Storytelling and you. Telling stories in your game even if you don't word good. Uh, I think that a lot of people who are roguelike developers have cool stories they want to tell uh, in their game, but at the same time, there's a fear of doing it wrong. And uh, there's some obstacles to doing it right. So let's see, I've got some experience. Uh, I'm Jim, I make games about crushing monsters and taking their stuff. I've been doing this for a while. Uh, Dungeon Man's is my pride and joy. Tangle Deep is Andrew's pride and joy, but I'm also proud and joyful to be part of it. Uh, that's what I do. And there's a Switch port coming out in N plus 30 days, which N being when Big N decides they're gonna ship it. So we've been giving it to Nintendo, they've been telling us to eat shit, but eventually, we're gonna ship it, it's gonna rule, and you can play it, so cool. Uh, so what we're gonna do is talk about, I don't have a clicker, do I? Son of a bitch. All right, we're gonna talk about stories. Uh, the objective here, or the purpose, is that we're going to learn how to discuss, how to tell these stories in roguelikes using the tools we already have. Things we already do in roguelikes when we make them and play them. Uh, I'm gonna show you some things that have already shipped, uh, real products, stuff that's abstract theory that I've been thinking about and practicing. And the reason this is important is because it brings more of your signature and passion into the game. Uh, I, that sounds highfalutin, but I, I, I believe it, right? If you, if you have the, 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 the fire and the lust and dedication to make a game of your own, uh, the more of you that can go into that, the better. And I think you can get some of that from storytelling. Uh, so what is storytelling? I, who cares? Academic descriptions suck, and we're not going to do them. <laughs> uh, no. What I'm thinking is this. You're, you're in the shower, or you're on the bus, or you're driving somewhere, and you've got this cool thing in your head. You've got this barbarian making a choice between two things he doesn't understand, or you've got these two dueling princesses fighting for the fate of something and they want to save bloodshed, but one of them has to die. Or exploring a mountain climbing, and you had this crazy story in your head, and you try to tell it to somebody, and it's like, bah, bah, but then the guy with the sword, bah, bah, and it doesn't come out right. It's like when you're thinking about a song, and you can hear it in your head, and then you try to, to sing it, or to hum it, or to play it, and you really aren't a musician yet, and it sounds like that kazoo version of Jurassic Park, like it just doesn't, right, and you know that feeling, and it, it sucks. So, it's a skill, you have to practice, but there's ways to do it in the games we already make, and I think that we can make that happen here. So, the first thing in storytelling in a game is putting the words in front of the player, right? And what we wanna do is make sure the information is in a way they, they can retain, and they choose to retain, right? Because you can, show them stuff they can keep and maybe they don't want to, but it's important to show them stuff in a way that, that they can appreciate and like, because if you have a great story, it falls apart if you show it wrong. And if you have a just okay story, it'll grow on the player if you present it in a way that's fun, because we know our players uh, have a little bit of brain sauce, and they create the story while they play, and they're part of it. So we, we kind of have respect for the player and say, look, you know, we're gonna spell a lot of stuff out for you, but not everything, in a game where like, we have ASCII symbols everywhere, like you do a lot of the mental lifting, you players, right? So we're cool with that. We're gonna show you stuff in a format that works along that way. So here's some stuff that already exists in the world of gaming, and the worst is the wall of text. Holy sh I mean, this happens all over the place. I love Castle of the Winds, right? It rules. But, you know, that was made back in the old century when maybe that's all the guy could do. It's like, I'm gonna write a story about King Lift of Lift Swanza. And, and, and it's a lot of words, right? And I'm sure you care because actually this is like one of the last encounters, so you're either at three in the morning, you're almost asleep, or you really give a crap, but it's a lot of words. And they go on and on and on, and so many games do this, and it just throws stuff at you. And it's so hard to maintain and to keep, and even if you wanna care, sometimes you're like, God dang it, just keep going, and you, it doesn't work, right? So the problem with this, first of all, is it's dense and it's rigid. I'm throwing this information at you in the way that I choose for you to get it, and you don't get a way to, you don't have a way as a player to sort of make it your own, right? It, there's not a lot of room for imagination when we're just throwing a wall of text to you, here's what's up, and players see it as an obstacle. Even somebody who likes games, when they see like three paragraphs of something, something primal, their lizard brain goes, no, and they wanna skip it, right? So that's too bad, we won't do that. There's something better, which is the option of putting books or notes, uh, or something to read in the game, right? So this is, this is the best screenshot of Elder Scrolls that exists, and Elder Scrolls does this all the time. They have lots of books to read, and that's cool. So there's all sorts of books you can find in Elder Scrolls that you pick up, and they've got optional content. Whatever, man, if you want to read that, that's cool. And that's something for you that you can do on your own time. So you find a book, you choose when to read it. I have a friend in this room who I won't name, but has told me one of his favorite experiences is putting on the VR crap in Skyrim, teleporting to the top of a spire in a wintry wind and reading books. 
in that VR world. How cool is that, right? That's neat. And, and it's cool that they can meander a bit from the core story, they're optional, but if you put mandatory plot information in these books, players may not read them, right? And so that's not so good. Also, if you don't word good, writing books is scary, right? If you're gonna write a bunch of paragraphs of information, that is, if you're, well, I don't write that well, it's kind of tough to do. So maybe this isn't the best. And then there's also, oh, by the way, Jupiter Hell, just went into beta, you can find it on Steam. And this is a product of our dear friend Cornell, who can't be here today because he's a ghost, actually because he's in Poland, and he came to PAX, right? That was his one Ameritrip for the year. He went to PAX, show off his game, he should be here now, he's really cool, he's working very hard. I just wanna advertise for him, so yeah. Also, back to work. <laughs> we can put words in front of the player using audio log. Now this is pricey, right? This is something that maybe is out of our reach. Um, it's cool because the information doesn't get in the way of gameplay. You're playing Doom, and you listen to some recording and you can still like blast monsters while somebody's talking about Doom stuff. It's, it's there and you can hear it. Uh, this is a screenshot from Horizon. It's an awesome game. And you search for audio logs, it can be neat. There's like a shiny thing, you're like, oh. And you go look at it with your little focusy thing and somebody tells a story and you can keep playing and that's great. It's really cool. Voice is an awesome way to add life to your characters and adventure. And it's totally practical and affordable if you're an indie dev married to a VO actor and you have the, hey, ask what you're playing, girl, on speed dial. If that's your case, then yeah, use voice. But I started this talk with the idea of, we're talking about stories and roguelikes and what we already have. And what we have is this, right? That is our canvas for telling stories. So here's what shows up. It's one of these, what is this, anybody? It's a dog. It's a wolf, right? It's a wolf because D is for dog, doggo, and wolves are canines, and that's the letter we use for that, if you didn't know. And here comes the wolf. It's going to attack you, and oh, it deals four damage with sharp canines, right? That's a wolf. They got teeth everywhere, and they use them to bite you. That's what they do. And then, oh, you attack back, and he uses bestial cunning to dodge out of the way because they're wolves, and they woof, and whatever. But then you hit him, and you do a whole bunch of damage. Like, yeah. And then it howls mournfully and dies, right? This is combat with a wolf. This is, this is it, pretty much what, what happens in a game when you are fighting wolves. Um, that D can be a lot. And it's a wolf, be an alpha wolf, a, a winter wolf, right? a dire wolf. What is a dire anything? That is a type of animal that I think only exists in fantasy, right? Are there real dire boars like on an island somewhere? I don't know, but like, you know what I mean, dire, right? That's cool. So it sells a bit of like, this is a fierce monster, right? So here comes this one. It's, what is this? All right, it's a glurg. <laughs> the hell is a glurg? I've never seen a glurg. Well, I have now, so bring it on, let's go fight. It shows up, and oh, what? Molten slashers. Uh, this, this glurg has molten slashers. I don't know what's going on. I got slashed multifully, that's bad. Okay, well, I'm gonna hit back, and like, what? Deflected phasic chitin, what even is that? Like, holy cow. So something's up, like this is a monster, it's only doing four damage, I guess I'm fine, but whoa, this has got molten slashers and it's phasing, and well, I'm gonna hit it, and I do a whole bunch of damage, and it die, oh, it, it kiters, <laughs> it chitters, all for ashes, all for Alska, what? And it's gone, right? Well, what, okay, that information just happened to me while I was playing, right? It's in the combat log, you have to do that to, to fight a monster and win. It's happening to you while you're playing. So a glurg is what? Okay, it's a, it's a glurg, there's like a glurg cinder, ooh, I don't know, apex glurg, I bet it's really tall, and then there's like, what the hell? Like, there's a whole bunch of things a glurg could be. Right? So you're fighting glurgs. Oh no, it's glurgs. And you're fighting them in a town, right? And the town is on fire, right? <laughs> if this is happening to you, okay, cool, this is gameplay. You're doing this and the townspeople are burninating and like there's glurgs everywhere and you're, you're trying to get out and you're the one, who, and you know what? This is 10 million billion jillion times better than this, right? Because this has happened in so many games, right? Uh, the proud survivor of the village of Bruno says, uh, the, 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 come on. Right? And if you, now everything I showed you is so practical. If you are anybody who's a hobby roguelike dev, don't do this. The hell with you if you do this, right? You can make this cool fight scene happening here, and this is gameplay anyway. Don't make a puppy cave, make a town on fire, right? The monsters are just as easy. It's the same series of tutorial steps, but there's theme and story to it, and you get it for free. Right? It's part of the game. You don't need this ridiculous wall of text. So what I'm gonna ask you to do is use the gameplay to show the player a story that is happening with them at the center and do not leave gameplay to tell them a story that is happening to them while they watch. Uh, it's, it's show, don't tell. I think everyone has heard that at some point in their lives. Now you've heard it again. Uh, and we can do it 
right? This isn't fancy, this isn't special, this is the tools we already have, the stuff we do. Okay, pop quiz. What's this? It's a sword. It's a long sword, cool, okay. And, and what is it? Uh, it's a, a one-handed sword. Great, we know this, we've seen this in games, you've seen item cards in games, pick it up. What do? Uh, great, what's your last name? It's awesome, I know everything you need to know about this sword, I'm gonna put it in so many monsters, and yeah, and... Well, okay, there's the flavor text. Oh, are you kidding me? We know it is a long, man, we know it's a weapon, we, did, well, we just said all this. Why do you write this, developer? Why do you do this? And, and it feels like we're checking off a checkbox, right? Oh, well, I made an item, it needs to have a text, uh, okay, here's one, right? You're wasting your own time, the player's reading time, you're reading disk space, and, and if you're localizing this, God help you, but you're wasting the money for that, right? Because somebody's translating that and like, oh great, like they probably just pulled it out of like some pre-packaged BS item description thing, but they still charge you per word, and, and that's something you don't want to do. So we've got this space. Let's use it to tell our story, right? Here's four different, I'm gonna go over each of these, I know there's a lot of words, sorry. Um, here's the first one. Great weapons are forged with Stenvian steel, but this one will have to suffice until then. What does that mean? It, not that much, but now you've seen the word Stenvian, right? It just happened to you while you're playing. And so if you find something like, hey, a Stenvian plate mail, or like a, if you see the word again, a Stenvian golem, uh oh, okay, you, you know there's something cool about that. And you can pepper your early items with this because the early items don't have much to say, so why not foreshadow a bit? Okay, this next one here. The history of nations is rich so often in blood. Tools such as these are the quill. Like, oh, that's so overwrought. But you know what? If you're making an overwrought game, if you're doing Final Fantasy Tactics style, like Ivalice, like drama, 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 everybody hangs themselves, like, cool. That is, that is a chance to help sell that without cutscenes, without dialogue. It's right there in the item. Uh, comedy answer, Comic Sans, like, ha, ha, ha. If you're making a silly game, who would do that? But you could, and then you've got this thing. And now, what's interesting, though, is the word you, do what you can to keep the business end point at the rats. It's second person. And I'll get into the difference between third, second, first person, why it matters for us, but that is something that, that actually matters, right? And then the last one here, I know it's a training weapon, but it's still a whole bunch of sharp and pointy metal. I'll make it work, right? Well, who is saying that? So Andrew gave me a gift. He let me get away with trying something in Tangle Deep, and I think it worked. I think the fans dig it. Uh, I, I like it, so that counts, right? Uh, it, the Tangle Deep is a story about Mariah. Mariah is the heroine. She has 12 different jobs and costumes, things you can be, but you're still playing this character. You can name her whatever, but it's a story about her and her exploration through Tangle Deep and the monsters she crushes and the things she explores. You learn about her through the items you pick up. Right? Everything you find has some flavor text, and they're all written in her thoughts about the item. And there's a whole bunch of stuff, right? As you continue to move forward, you find more interesting gear, and some of it is stuff she expected to find anyway. Okay, she knew as an adventurer she's going to find a, a better sword. It happens to everybody, right? Unless they die. So she's got this, and she's excited. Okay, cool. This is going to happen. And then, whoa, crazy magic. Like, I don't understand, right? But she's learning, she's curious. She's curious about these things, and she asks questions, and so you, you can see that in her. And then she's, you know, other things show up, and it's like, oh, wow, okay, that's weird. Like, this is a curved sword. Maybe she hasn't seen one before. Like, well, that's really something. Like, well, the sword is really curvy. Like, you know, and, and it's, it's kind of a, it's a tongue-in-cheek chuckle, whatever, but it's, it's a thread that runs through your game and doesn't require you to, to leave the gameplay space to, to get it, right? It's, it's something that just happens to you while you're playing. Uh, there's a whole bunch of words here also, but you find scrolls and Mariah is learning to read the scroll language, right? She's learning to translate runes. So in many cases, the yellow stuff is the rune translation. So the first two uh, work and they rhyme. The next two don't. Uh, she doesn't understand the words like dirtful and fat, wet, splash, and she's getting it wrong. And there's a hack there because this is about if you can't word good, if you can't make something that works, cheat around it, like I was trying to make rhymes for all the scrolls and I'm like, I don't know, toxic, like, what rhymes with toxic? Like, boxic, like I did nothing, right? I mean, I'm sure there's a word. So I was like, well, why not just, just not do it? Right? You have that license to do it. And, and so getting around that, it also made the character a little more interesting because she's trying to figure stuff out and she's not quite there yet. Uh, so I wanna talk about flavor in items and the third, second, first person which I think is, is useful and good. Um, the third person is, we've seen this a lot. The armor is incredibly ornate and flickers with arcane potential. Okay, you've seen this when you pick up a fancy armor, a magic, whatever. Second person, there's a narrator separate from the game. You're reading the text, but the voice is from someone who's talking to you 
and that's actually separate from the game itself. Right, so there's that narrator who's delivering you information. It's maybe the dungeon master feeling or that there's a story being told and there's that presence. So when it talks to you, do this, um, that feels a little different than sticking to third person. Now, a lot of us, myself included, uh, mix third and second person by accident, maybe. I think consistency is better. I know in my future project, I will pick one and roll with it. Uh, because it really can change, if you stick with it and go with it, right, it can change the tone of what's going on. But first person, first person item text, anything is possible with first person com, right? Like you can do so much. So the armor is incredible. I can feel the latent power within, coursing over every ornate little carving. Well, that's the other things there written. Uh, but you also got like, oh, this thing's so heavy. The magic had better be amazing because I can't move in it. And that talks about your character. Like, what did you just find this magic treasure and you're, you're complaining that's too heavy? Like, come on. But if that's your character and that's what you're selling, okay. And then you've got, oh, the uh, mail of a true sage blade. And the second's, okay, cool guy, whatever. But if, you're, if your character is pompous and full of themselves and, hey, now you know what a sage blade is, right? You're just giving this to the player while they find items. Or, wow, right? This is someone who's just like, awesome, I'm here to crush monsters and get loots, and they're, they're murder hobos who want to get rich, and you're, you're, you're saying this is happening in the game anyway. All of that stuff, the information about the armor, the real critical stuff, it's called like ornate plate. You can see the stats on it, plus two magic versus rabbits and all this other stuff. So that information's there. You see a picture of armor if you have sprites, and if you don't, you know it's armor because it says armor on it, and it goes in the armor slot. So that flavor text, doesn't need to just say, like, it's a fancy armor. I mean, it could, but it can also do more. And it's space that you're going to use anyway, and the player's going to read it anyway. Um, so these are the, those are the two things that I think anyone can do we could, right now. Your project at home and your laptop, you can make this work. You can start trying it if it suits you. Cool. I want to touch on some more stuff. I feel like this talk was going to go forever. I have a couple things. What the hell time are we? Oh, I got like 15 minutes. <laughs> All right, cool. So I wrote... A thing about, now here, next one is, uh, just saying, okay, do this, I just said this out loud, don't waste space. Really, that's the important thing. Don't waste space to just check off your official RPG development boxes. You've got the space to use things, do it. Dialogues, right? Dialogues and character voice, last thing I want to touch on, um, don't read all that stuff. It's just saying there's, there's two different types. You've got talking to monsters in critical encounters, talking to shopkeepers even, right? Because there's some words there. And, and they don't necessarily even have to mean anything, but they're a chance to see more about your character and see more about the world. You can learn about Duke Dirtbeak here. And, and Mirai has like three, like, I'm a hero sort of responses. And all of them are just like plucky young adventurer, right? None of them are smart ass and none of them are whatever. She's just like, I'm a plucky young adventurer. Um, the trick here is, first of all, it's tough if you're a newbie, right? If you don't write a lot of stuff, character dialogue can be daunting. Um, you you want to say the right thing or the funny thing or the interesting thing, and you, you fret about getting it right, it's fine. Don't despair. Just do it. Um, do it a lot. And I'll show you a trick that I think might help you in this. Uh, the important information comes first, flavor second. So if you have a dialogue that's a shop, you have to address it as a shop before you go on about how the guy only sells fluffy things or how he's from space or whatever. Like the important part is this is a store. The dialogue has to get the information across or else the fun things you add or the flavor you add becomes confusion because they want to get to the, the real thing first and then the sauce comes on top. Really you don't like give someone a brick of salt with chicken sprinkled on top, right? You want to make sure the meat is there first and then the spice goes on second. Say everything you need to say but no more or less, right? So what that means is we always say, well, don't use a lot of words and, and try to be concise, unless your character's wordy. And if that's the case, do it, right? Commit, because you know rules are made to be broken. So the idea of like, well, I want consistent, I want a concise, I want just the information, unless you're talking to like a mad scientist or some, some Looney Tune who's gonna go on and on and on about stuff, do it then in that case, make that character happen. And consistent voice, this is the bedrock. This will make your characters work and be memorable, whether it's the hero or a shopkeeper or a villain or whatever. This is the consistent voice, is the trick, and here's what I'm gonna give to you, a powerful technique for character dialogue for rookies. Step one, think about an existing fictional character, right? Someone from any fiction, whether it's your favorite animu or a video game or a movie or a book or a comic book, whatever, like think about somebody that you know well and just rip them off entirely, steal them. <laughs> like, it's yours now. It's yours now, and nobody can stop you, right? This is your thing. So, 
So now you have this character in your head and you, you nope, that's your character and you're gonna steal them 100%. But the trick is that it doesn't have to align with the character you're writing for. And here's an example I'll give you. You have um, a blacksmith, right? You've got, this, you've got this young blacksmith. She just finished Blacksmith Academy boot camp, and she's really good at hammering things. But she's also, uh, you know, she wants to grow, she wants to get better, and she's excited about metalworking, and she's excited about the history of armor. And so what, who am I gonna slap onto her? Deckard Cain, right? I'll pull the old man from Diablo, stay a while and listen, like that guy. I'll pull him and put him onto her. And it doesn't mean she talks in an old man voice about, and then walks with a cane, but Deckard Cain also is like, history is important to victory just as much as strength is. And it's worth it to be patient. And oh, I get excited about riddles and puzzles. And that character has a million zillion lines written for them. You can just take that, right? It's yours now. And then you could put it on your other character and use it as a resource. And this is a crutch, right? This is a crutch. Because we want to have our own characters in our head but fleshing them out is difficult. And when you, again, when you, you picture a pretty song and then you try to sing it and it just sounds like a bunch of whistling farts and it's like, well, that's not what I wanted to do. If you do this, you can focus and train. I still do this and, and I, I guess I'm using a little more advanced technique. Here is uh, Shara, the antagonist, I would never say villain, the antagonist of Tangle Deep. Um, she uh, ends up working against you in a number of ways and I thought of two characters that I kind of um, mix and morphified to be a match for how she thinks and talks. And the first one is uh, Jaina Proudmoore from Warcraft, right? All I ever wanted to do was study. Old Jaina, not like crazy new murder Jaina, but the one from before who is, you know, she's an idealist. She thinks that, that there's a way to do the right thing without being terrible. She, she's excited about studying and learning and she wants, to, she wants to find out more about this and that and, and it drives her, but she's also got a bit of, of iron in her. She'll do what she has to do, right? So that's part of her, but alone, it's too nice. So we need a bad guy, and this is, this is Vane Solidor from the best Final Fantasy, which is 12. And he's the bad guy in that one. And this guy, um, he can be ruthless. He thinks he's doing the right thing. He is driven like a Mack truck to get that done. But he's also moved by things he doesn't entirely understand. There's this ridiculous ghost who hangs out with him and just goes, boo, when he tries to do something that the ghost doesn't want. The ghost is just like, boo, don't. And so he's, he's kind of guided by voices in his head a little bit toward a purpose, and something similar happens to her. So those two things together are what I thought about um, when I was writing dialogue for her in the discussions you have with her. All right, I, I took them, they're mine now, right? They're, I just took them and used those things and built this character. Uh, I think that stuff will work for you. So we have, uh, you know, borrow completely and entirely from other characters for your dialogue, right? Use the space given to you in your own gameplay, in the combat log, in the item descriptions, like it's all there, players are gonna read it anyway, use that stuff and avoid walls of text if you wanna deliver information and you can tell your stories and you don't have to be great at it, right? You can use those little bits and pieces to make a story happen. We have respect for the player, they'll fill in the gaps and um, then you'll get better at it the more you do it. It's a skill like any other and I think I'm out of time, uh, that's pretty much it. Although maybe not, do I have time for questions? I have time for questions. Please, somebody have a question. What do you got? Anybody, just raise your hand. No? That's cool, no questions? Hey, there's somebody. You, sir, in the chair. I really appreciate this. Keep going. So you mentioned earlier that... Here, here, take a microphone. There's a microphone for you. I got it. Would you recommend... Oh, God, that's loud. It is loud. Would you recommend... For maybe more like experienced writers, kind of, let's say you don't want to overwhelm, like every time I see magic cards, um, they'll have like the functional text and then the flavor text below it in italics or something. Right. Let's say I don't want to, let's say the player's going through a bunch of weapons, like in an inventory and I don't want to overwhelm the user with text. Would you recommend trying to uh, write it in such a way that you give it the character but you still like... Uh, present the functionality as well, or is that like, could it be done? Do you recommend it? How do, what are your thoughts on that? I would do functionality first and make it completely separate from the flavor, like the magic cards do. And so in Tangle Deep's case, the item cards have like clear stat information, crystal clear, blue colors and pretty lights and all that stuff. And then underneath it in a different color is the flavor text. Um, you, you, you'll be overwhelmed, I guess, if you read everything. And, and I would hope the players do as they pick up stuff. But what kind of prevents that from being too much of a problem is the weapons are themed. Uh, if you start finding and using claws, 
right? Claws are the wild child class uh, weapon, and they're a little more furious and, and bestial, and Mirai kind of realizes, man, she's, she's a cold-blooded killer, right? She's, using, she's Wolverine and people down with these claws, and she didn't think she was gonna be that way, but maybe she has to be that way. And because there's a theme through the weapons, you, you, you see players who are like, oh, well, the next claw is gonna talk more about like, just claw things, right? And you, you can see that, and there's something to look forward to. So there's a lot of information, none of it's critical, but you're reading it anyway when you're playing. And you know what, some players are not just gonna care about it, that's fine, they don't have to. But it's there, and it doesn't get in the way. So if you're an experienced writer, and you feel like, you know what, this item doesn't deserve much text, you're probably right, go with your gut, but I think there's an opportunity there, if you want it, to put some, some life into it. So thank you for your question. Uh, anyone else? Uh, oh, with the microphone. Thank you. Um, okay, so I've got a character who the player thinks they understand, right? They, and the player thinks they know what motivates them, but then they have a backstory, and hidden in the backstory is a little twist, oh. right? So I'm not sure how to like convey that to the player, though. Like, I'm okay. not sure how to present to the player this backstory that they'll eventually learn throughout the course of the game, maybe. Right, uh, right. Which will hopefully at the end twist and then inform the player why the character is actually doing cool. what they're doing. Cool. Have you, and, and so the question was about, I, I have a character with a backstory that's got a twist at some point, and you want to sell that. The information first to like make you care, and then the twist. And the twist only matters if you know what's being twisted, right? So if you don't get that initial part, you can't tell. Um, I would ask you, have you played the first original Bioshock? Okay, so I'm no kidding. Like, as a research project, it's homework for you. That game has one of the best versions of that. Like, you think you know, you think you know, you think you know, oh, you did know, and then the mic gets dropped on your face, and it's totally crazy, and it feels good, it's part of the story, and then you get to keep playing, right? Because it's kind of like a, a change that happens, and then it drives the rest of your story. Um, that's good homework for you. I think the way that they do that is, in that game, they have a lot of other people talking to you, and giving you kind of nublets of who you are because of that which you could do through things you find and people you talk to, they can tell you about this and that and the other thing in small bites. And you don't really need to sell like the whole life story of the player, right? just the pertinent parts that are gonna get stomped on when the twist happens. So pick those important things and work on them. And I think you'll see that Bioshock does that really well. Uh, I'm sure it's like 31 cents on Steam you know, every other month, right? And you can grab it. And it's, it's a first person shooter. It is like not permadeath and like, real time, but I mean, whatever, stomach, <laughs> choke that down, right, and, uh, and go through it. Or, or take the Cliff's Notes and watch like Let's Plays and YouTubes of the pertinent parts, and, and if you really want to do that, you could. But I think playing it's a better experience. So, so yeah, that's there for you, cool. Uh, I think we have time for maybe two more, I don't know. Yeah. Show me what you got. Yes, you there. People closest to me. Hey there. I had a quick question about uh, understanding the greater scheme of a story. Should I be able to tell a full story or like read on all that abstract stuff like The Power of Myth by John Campbell or any of that to understand how to write flavor text well? Uh, you're saying should you research other stuff? I'm asking. Greater, more abstract understanding, like um, understanding like what the hero's journey is or like what that's all about and that sort of thing. Oh, I see. Well, okay. Um, I, if I think I understand your question, part of it is yes, absolutely research stuff for that. If you, if you want to learn about the, the 12 steps of the story and the, the long dark night of the soul and that whole journey, I think that's cool. Um, I think it's actually, I don't know it well enough to teach it, so maybe I don't know it well enough at all. Like if you can't explain it simply, you don't know it. I believe that is unfortunately true in my case. But I do think that you need to say, okay, well what, what of that is really important and what of it's fluff? And the important part stays critical path. The fluff supports it, it's on the other side. And if you want to say that journey happens to you, then you also have a game, even a procedurally generated roguelike has like acts and phases and you go from here to here to here or depth levels in the dungeon. So you can use those markers to create these, these, these changes in the hero and how they think and how they act and how they respond to things can change too. You could set up your, for instance, if somebody's being corrupted or, or becoming, a, changing their attitude, you can change the way they respond to the same shopkeeper, right? You can just send your code say, well, here's the responses once they, like the toolbox meter goes like to here, now they're a toolbox and they're gonna say these mean things instead. Um, you can do that, right? And so that lets you have that character take a trip and again, it just sort of, while you're playing, you experience that. Um, did I come close? Oh, we'll talk after if you want. You can bug me afterwards. All right, thank you. And you, sir. So beyond uh, telling part of the story through the environment, what kind of process do you like for crafting the environment to begin with? 
Uh, I gave a talk on that, actually. Uh, and I can't do it in 30 seconds, but um, everything matters for, for the environment. The monster names, the item names, the places you go, the way that you get there, the, there's so much that you can do in tone. Like every single step of what you do in the game can build a setting. And I think setting's different from story, right? Oh, sorry? Oh, sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, I the... uh, uh, where, I where's the talk? If it is available, on the interwebs, that? right? I think uh, how, how the last rogue cell here on this okay. very stage. Although I stood over here like <laughs> half the time, here. I found that out too. But uh, that's on the internet for you can find last year's talk. I talked about that, and then the one before I talked about last last time was storytelling. The one before a different storytelling. It was a surprise storytelling per, uh, persistence, and the one before that was tone. So uh, I will sell you the DVD for like 900. No, I won't. But uh, yeah, but please look it up. And then also, I'll be happy to answer questions like in detail later if you like. Thanks. So cool. We out of time? Yep. Cool. Oh, wait, one more thing. This is happening again. I do this every year. And I would like you to help with this if you could. Um, this is happening. The way this works is people in the real world go out and do something to donate to fight hunger. You, most, mostly it's like buying one of those $10 bags of food at a grocery store. Uh, that's the easiest way to do it. But if you can do something to put at least $10 into some way to fight hunger around Thanksgiving, email that receipt, a picture of it, your actual proof of, of altruism, to hungerclock.com, and then a key happens to you, right? A game key of your choice among what we have, or maybe a random key, or maybe a bunch of keys if you win a D20 roll. Also, we get some fiction from developers who write cool things, and um, I am doing this again. If you want to help me, please tell me, and, and contact me, or talk here, or whatever, because I need some support for this, and I'll explain that to you. Should you come by and say, I want to help stop the hunger clock, I will talk to you. Thank you very much for your time. I hope you enjoyed this.